Good morning, everybody. It's me, Pastor Mike. Merry Christmas to y'all. Thank you for joining us online for worship today. We're thankful to be able to come to you together online on this first Sunday after Christmas. We're blessed to be able to bring worship to you this morning. And as, as, we, as we jump into this, I want to invite you to, to pray with me before we begin. There's a few things that are coming up that you want to know about. We're going to be starting a new series of classes called Disciple. Uh, this is a long-term, long study of the Old Testament and New Testament. It's just an amazing way to, to get a handle and a better, deeper grasp of your faith. People have been asking me big questions, and the big questions that they've been asking can only be answered with a big look at the scriptures. And so we're going to be doing that. You'll hear more about that come January. Um, what else is going on? Oh, did you get new technology for Christmas? Did someone give you a new phone or a tablet? Well, we've got some tech wizards here that want to help you learn how to use those to the best of your ability. And so again, be looking for information about our, our uh, tech university coming in middle of January so you can learn how to use your devices to the best of your ability. And with all those things said, I just want to open us in our time of worship today in prayer. Prayer for our friends, our family, and for our nation. Would you all pray with me? God, we thank you that you bring us together this morning to worship you uh, from the comfort of, of wherever we are, whether we're traveling or at home. Um, we are blessed to come before you uh, to worship you in, in, in word and in deed, to lift your name up in praise and in prayer. Bless us this morning as we encounter you in your word. We pray this in your son's holy name. Amen. There is a God so big no one could fathom How he holds this world and the universe together Though he has all power, he was born to us a little baby so he could be called God with us. Emmanuel.
my dear sweet William is always late. He's always doing one more thing before he leaves, before he goes someplace, before he does this or that. And I blame it on the fact that the boy was eight days late. Now, if you have ever been pregnant and have ever been pregnant and your child is late, you feel like you are going to be pregnant for, well, the rest of your life. And so as we, I was convinced that William was gonna be born on October the 11th. And he wasn't born this, until the 17th. I guess he was only six days late, but I just told you he was born eight days late, but whatever, he was late. It felt like a million years. So I was convinced he was gonna be born on the 11th. He was not born on the 11th. And on the 14th, my sister, Rena, my younger sister, she came to visit me. And the whole time she was visiting, I was having contractions. I was really having those like Braxton Hicks or like what they call false labor contractions because nothing was consistent and nothing was regular and we were just waiting. Now we didn't just sit around, we did some stupid things like decided to go on a 10 mile walk without water or food. And I'm like 12 years pregnant, um, just waiting for this baby to come out and we, you know, we had some good times together. We had some laughs. I remember Rena, she would sing to my belly and, you know, sing the song, you know, the song from, <laughs> from The Wizard of Oz where Glinda sings to all the, she sings to all the munchkins. She sings, come out, come out wherever you are and meet the young lady who fell from the star. Anyway, so she was singing that to my belly, just waiting for sweet William to come out. And we waited. We waited, we waited, and I kept having contractions, but really they weren't right. Again, they was false labor. It wasn't really anything at all. Nothing hurt, so it, was, it wasn't really good because um, nothing was happening. And I remember Rena was like, she was like, oh, let's start calculating them on my phone. Let's start counting them and timing them. And at one point I just said, stop counting this baby, it's never coming out. So Rena leaves town. Tuesday afternoon and Wednesday afternoon, William was born. You've all met him. We all know that he was born again. So, uh, and he's now eight, but we all have those times of waiting in our lives where we're just waiting and waiting and waiting for something to be happening. I know that I've had lots of times of waiting where I was just sitting and waiting for something to be happen, to get engaged, to get married. Uh, I remember as a kid, we had to sit in the we had to sit in the hallway and wait until our parents said it was time for us to open our Christmas presents. I think until we were adults, we had to do this. I think maybe until we had kids of our own, we had to wait in the hallway until our parents said it was time to come out and open the Christmas gifts. Anyway, I'm rolling my eyes at my parents, not at me, but you know, and I think a lot of us are waiting for 2020 to be over. And I believe that a lot of our faith is waiting. Because we're, we kind of live in this now and not yet. And I believe that for thousands of years that the people of the faith and the people of the book have been waiting. In the Hebrew Bible and the Old Testament, people were waiting. They were waiting for the promised redemption that came in Jesus Christ. And we now, as the people who live and know the redemption of Jesus Christ, are waiting for the restoration. We're waiting for those promises that Jesus made that he would come back. We're waiting for those promises to be fulfilled. And we live in this friction in our faith between the now and the not yet. And as we live in that friction, we have to ask ourselves, what are we waiting for in our faith? So I want you to think about that as we go to our next section of worship. What are you waiting for in your faith? One, two. Have you heard the story of the baby boy? Baby boy, 
the baby boy. Have you heard the story of the baby boy born in Bethlehem? The angels sang that blessed night born in Bethlehem. They came from heaven dressed in white born in Bethlehem. Have you heard the story of the baby boy Baby boy, baby boy, have you heard the story of the baby boy born in Bethlehem? Three wise men came from far and wide, born in Bethlehem. They followed the star to the baby's side, born in Bethlehem. Have you heard the story of the baby boy, baby boy? Baby boy, have you heard the story of the baby boy born in Bethlehem? Born in Bethlehem. See the baby sleeping on this Christmas morn. The story of the baby boy, baby boy, baby boy. Have you heard the story of the baby boy born in Bethlehem? The angels played in a heavenly band, born in Bethlehem, spreading goodness and joy across the land, born in Bethlehem. Have you heard the story of the baby boy, baby boy, baby boy? Have you heard the story of the baby boy born in Bethlehem? Have you heard the story of the baby boy, baby boy, baby boy? Have you heard the story of the baby boy born in Bethlehem? Born in Bethlehem. Hallelujah, have you heard? So we have just celebrated Christmas. We're now on December the 27th. We've celebrated Christmas. We've wrapped and unwrapped presents. We've decorated, and hopefully your house is still decorated. Mine will be until at least the first of the year. George and I have different ideas of when the house should be undecorated. George thinks no later than the 2nd of January. I think we should wait a few more days, but you can write in the comments what you think the Manahan should do. I hope George loses. Um, anyway, I do like to keep my Christmas decorations up a little longer than he does. But um, regardless, we have had this time of waiting and anticipation in our Advent season, and now we have celebrated Christmas. We have acknowledged that the, and celebrated that the promises that God made in the Old Testament have been fulfilled. And we are now in another waiting time as we wait for the restoration of Jesus Christ to come to the world. And I believe that Jesus knew that we would be in this waiting time, this holding pattern. And I believe that he prepares us for that holding pattern. He did that to his disciples. The last probably five to eight chapters of the book of John are times where Jesus is preparing his disciples for what's to come. And I believe that he's preparing us for what is to come. Because what Jesus had done with his disciples was he had taught them, he had taught them, he had taught them, he had taught them. And now he's saying, okay, this thing that I've taught you, this waiting that's about to happen, it's going to be fulfilled. And so I'm preparing you for what is going to happen. And his disciples, as usual, this time it's Thomas, are like, wait, but I don't, but I, 
They don't know what really is going to happen, even though Jesus has been teaching them and preparing them. And I believe Jesus is preparing and teaching us. So would you hear our scripture from this morning? John 14, beginning at the first verse. Jesus says to his disciples, Do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. For in my Father's house there are many dwelling places. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and take you to myself, so that where I am, there you may be also. And you know the way to the place where I am going. But Thomas said to Jesus, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you know me, you have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So the disciples all along have been prepared for what's going to happen. They know that Jesus is the Messiah, the Savior, and they know that he is eventually going to die and rise again. And then he will eventually go to heaven where we wait for all of us, for the consummation of ages, for the restoration. And yet the disciples are like, wait, but you told us that, but I don't really understand it and I'm not getting it and what's going on. And they start to get panicky. Next, in the next part of the chapter in 14, if you want to read it, Philip goes on and on about, well, but are you this and are you that? And, and Peter previously had been like, but are you the savior? And all of these questions that are asked of the disciples, Jesus continues to tell them, I am with you. And I will continue to be with you. Because what Jesus is telling them is really what I consider the four-story gospel. And the four-story gospel goes like this. It's that God created the world. And he created it, and he created it beautifully. And he gave the world to us as human beings. But then... Because of the fall, because sin came into the world through Adam and Eve, there was sin and brokenness that needed to be redeemed. And that sin and brokenness continued to pervade. And Christ came and he redeemed the world. But even as Christ came and redeemed the world and rid us of our sin and our brokenness, the world still needs to be restored. The world is still broken and in need of coming again of Christ. And in that coming again of Christ, we will be restored. We will be restored into what God had desired in that perfect creation. That restoration will be the consummation of all the work that God has been doing in the lives of God's people from creation, through the fall, through redemption in Jesus Christ. And now, when he will redeem the world. But see, right now we're living into that New Testament hope. And that hope is not just that we're going to get to go to heaven, but we're living in that New Testament hope of the now and the not yet. And what that means is that we are living into the kingdom of God right now as we can see it. But as Paul says, we can only see through the light, uh, through the mirror dimly. 
But then shall we know, and then we shall be known when we come face to face with Christ. Again, when we are redeemed, we've already been redeemed, when we are restored in Jesus Christ, when that consummation happens. So I want to ask you, what do we do while we wait? While we live in the now and the not yet? I want to say we have been blessed this last year to be able to produce such an amazing online service. I got to say thank you to our incredible musicians, our praise team, our choir, our quartet. I got to say thank you to all of our our technology people that are making things happen behind the scenes, especially I got to lift up uh, Ian Butterfield and all the work that he does to make sure that the service not only sounds good in the recording, but he makes sure that we sound good when we're out live. So Ian, thank you. Thank you for all of the work that you do. And if you encounter Ian, make sure you give him huge thanks because he's working extra hard to make sure all of these services happen for you all. I also have to thank our staff that's been working extra hard during this pandemic to make sure that the church continues to be vital, uh, continues to reach, teach, and serve all of our community. Uh, you guys know who you are. Thank you for all the ways that you work. And so as we kind of close this year out together and we, we come into this last um, portion of our service, I, I want it to be filled with thanks. I want it to be filled with gratitude. It's one of the things that marks our church is grace and gratitude. And so as, as we come into this next song and we're preparing to give of our hearts and our lives, what are you really thankful for this last year? Um, one of the things I know is that all of the struggles that we've gone through ha have made us aware of all the things that we need to be thankful for. So what is something that you need to be, what is something that you are really thankful for this year? Please do me the favor of adding that in the comments. And of course, as, as the song is going, we'd encourage you to give any way you know how. You can give by giving directly to the church via mail. Uh, you can also give online by pointing your web browser to oceansidepress.org slash give. You can also give via texting. Uh, you text the word Oceanside Press, P-R-E-S, to the number 77977. Again, it's Oceanside Press to 77977, and you can give directly that way. We're thankful for this year, uh, for all that has happened and all that we've learned about ourselves and how we've learned how to trust God in the midst of all these things. We're thankful for the ways that we've grown uh, and recognizing that the church is so much more than what we ever thought it was before. And we're blessed because we're, we're coming into a brand new year and we're thankful for how God's going to be working there. Let's continue our time in worship. Early night, all of the stars above my head shine brightly. It's Christmas time Got all the people that I love here beside me There's something different now. The snow is glistening I like the world prayed the same prayer And God was listening Lift up your eyes to the sky And hear the angels sing
So when I was a teenager, my senior year of high school, my parents had always said that they were very strict when we were little, and then they started to give us more and more freedoms as they prepared to kick us out of the house. Oh wait, no, that's not what they really said as they prepared to let us fly on wings like an eagle. That's more like what parents say, but really they were getting ready for us to get out of the house. And uh, I remember that my parents had always said that about parenting. And even as a teenager, I remember them saying that as like, we were very strict when you were babies and very, well, maybe not babies, but we were very strict when you were toddlers and uh, young children so that we could teach you what was important. And then we would Send, set you free. So my senior year of high school, my mom, my dad too, and maybe it was some of the choices that I was making was making my parents do this, but I swear my parents got stricter my senior year of high school. I had had all of this freedom and then all of a sudden my parents got super strict and they were so mean. Not really, but they were. I felt like they were so mean to me that senior year. And I think a lot of that had to do with, although I was the second child going away, I think a lot of it was that they knew I wasn't really ready to leave. And they also knew that once I left, I'd be gone. And it's true because except for for a few summers uh, before I started my real, you know, before I started in my mid 20s when I was started being a pastor, um, I really wasn't home anymore for longer than a few weeks at a time. I spent a couple of summers at home in seminary, but um, I really wasn't at home with them. And so I think they wanted to hold on to me as much as possible. And I think a lot of parents do that. I've seen a lot of parents where their kids, they're not super strict with their kids and then all of a sudden in their senior year, they all of a sudden get super strict and it's because they realize their child is going to leave the nest. That all that they have been preparing them to do is now happening. And I think as we read our passage this morning, I think that's what the disciples are doing. Yes, they don't fully understand what's going to happen with Jesus, but they also want to hold on to as much of Jesus as they can. They want to, they don't want him to go away physically. They want him to stay. They want him to be near him. And I get it. I so get it. If I had Jesus in front of me, I would want him to stay for as long as possible. But I also know that Jesus had a plan. And part of that plan was for him to go away for a while, still be present in our lives through the Holy Spirit, but for him to go away for a while physically until it was finally restoration. Because Christ knew about the four-story gospel. He was there at creation. He was sad with the Father when we fell and chose to go a different way. And he redeemed us and is waiting to restore us. And I think that the disciples give us two very important clues about what we're supposed to do in this waiting time. As we live in this New Testament hope, but as we also wait for the restoration of Christ. And I think the disciples teach us two things. The first thing is that the disciples took in whatever they could. The disciples said, yes, I want to know as much as you can teach me, Jesus. Teach me, teach me, teach me, teach me. And I believe that that was a very important part of their life and their faith with Jesus. And I think that we're called to do the same thing. We're called to take in as much as we can of Jesus through prayer and scripture reading and time and community, however that looks right now. 
We're supposed to take as much in as we can. And then I believe that the disciples did what we are supposed to do. That in this time of waiting for the restoration, for the consummation of ages when Christ shall come again and the world shall be restored and there will be a new heaven and a new earth, I believe that we are called to do exactly like the disciples did. Because Jesus went from earth to heaven. And when he did that, he told his disciples to go out and make disciples of all nations to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And remember that I am with you even to the end of the age. Believe that Jesus is calling us to do what the disciples did. To go out and to do the work of Jesus Christ. That as we wait, that that's part of the preparation process for the restoration is that we are called to reach out to the least of these. We are called to make disciples. We are called to teach others of this faith and this love that we have known and we have experienced. And we are called this day on a waiting day to say yes to Christ to say yes to Christ in our lives and say yes to the work that Christ is calling us to do. And it may be hard. It may be, make us uneasy. But I believe that in this waiting time that we are being called to the work of Jesus Christ in the lives of our community and all that we come in contact with. So whether that work is forgiving our brothers and sisters or feeding the homeless or the working poor or starting a 501c3 or rocking babies in the NICU or making blankets for new babies, or whatever your call is in your life. Christ is calling us to do his work while we wait. Because we know where he is and we know he's coming back. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus Christ, we thank you for the promise of restoration. We thank you that your story of redemption is not over. That you are redeeming us. You have redeemed us and that you will restore us anew. And we pray, Jesus Christ, that each and every one of us will come to know that restoration. And that as we wait for the new heaven and the new earth, that we would do the work of Jesus Christ in our own lives and in our communities and with all of those that we come in contact with. So that our waiting would not be in vain, but that our waiting would be in the hope that you bring. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Jesus, Jesus, oh, what a wonderful child. Jesus, Jesus, so holy, meek and mild. I've new hope, new joy. Won't you listen? 
for Christ to restore the earth. But as we wait, we are called to live in the hope of Jesus Christ who redeems the world. And we are called as the people of faith to do that redeeming work wherever we go and whatever we do. And now go in the grace, peace, and love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah. 